So I'd just like to introduce the panelists for today's session. So uh, in no apparent order, waving will be appreciated. So first up, we have Andy uh, from Barker College, Head of Digital Learning. We also have Annabelle, uh, Annabelle, my apologies, uh, from the University of Melbourne, uh, Sydney Learning, uh, Senior Learning Designer. We always have the very popular Marita Bird, uh, speaking from Taz TAFE and a popular figure on the uh, Vocational Education and Training User Group. And finally, we have Sean, uh, the Associate, Associate Professor from the University of Auckland. Thank you so much. Well, a bit late in the afternoon, but you know, we'll, we'll, we'll be planning to get there. So a little bit about how we'll be running today's session. There will be some engagement posts today. So firstly, if you would like to reach out in relation to asking questions of a specific panelist uh, or discussing that as well, we recommend using the Q&A feature, which you'll see down the bottom of your Zoom device. However, if you just want to have a chat with your peer uh, and, and start a discussion, a bit like comment thread, please feel free to use the chat. Actually, if you'd like to get on the chat now, um, that would be fantastic. Please feel free to press chat and introduce yourself and where you're from today. Um, that would be an awesome way to get the engagement started in the chat. And lastly, if someone says something really cool, quite witty, quite funny, probably won't be myself, please feel free to use uh, the emoji to get involved in the discussion. Uh, please note there is a raise hand feature um, just during the amount just due to the amount of people that we could possibly have attending this particular webinar, we will not be acknowledging that as well. So please feel free for any questions to go through the Q&A. If not, uh, introduce yourself via the chat function. Uh, now, with all those formalities out of the way, I would like to, of course, David raises his hand. Um, in, in turn of all that, I'd now to like to pass on to Paul, who um, will take us through today's discussion. Thank you very much, everyone, for attending. Yep. Hi, everyone. Um, Rio, um, I'm not sure of oh, actually. Uh, I'm just seeing here that there's some issues with the chat. If uh, Adam, if you can have a look into that, that'd be wonderful. Um, <clears throat> but uh, yeah, first of all, just give me one moment. So um, we'd first of all like to start off with an acknowledgement of, of country. Uh, so we would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land we meet on in Australia and pay respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Their ongoing knowledge, resilience and struggles as the first peoples of this land we now call Australia and thank them for having us on their country. And for those of you from, uh, from New Zealand, Tihe Māori ora, e nā reo, rau rangatira mā. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Kia ora. All right, so welcome everyone. We've got some wonderful guests here uh, on the webinar this afternoon. And um, uh, we've got the, the topic today is a very interesting topic. It's... Um, been on everyone's radar, I think, indirectly with a lot of stuff that's been happening, particularly with artificial intelligence, but uh, it's also brought to mind uh, you know, what we do with assessment uh, as instructors and as educators. And, uh, you know, it's kind of brought to light some of the, the shortcomings that we've had with traditional assessment in particular, and how we need to adapt, particularly with the, the changes that are happening, uh, so that we can better assess uh, what our students are actually capable of. Um, and uh, I think the, the first thing that we want to start off with today is to have a bit of a chat about what are some of the shortcomings of traditional assessment. So I know we've got some interesting views from our panellists on this. Uh, I'd like to start off with Marita. Uh, yeah, what, what are some of your thoughts on some of the shortcomings that traditional assessment uh, shows, uh, well, shows or doesn't show <laughs> in relation to student skills and, uh, and learning? Oh, look, to be honest, well, I think probably my, I mean, I come from a very strong vet background, so I'm always going to have that really hands-on approach. 
traditional assessment depends what you call traditional assessment. If you can't see it, if you can't talk about it, if they can't explain it, then it's it's not really as valid as what we'd hoped. So I think the biggest shortcoming is that we're not teaching students how to hustle. So if you've got a knowledge evidence and you ask one question that says identify, in what world is that meeting the dimensions of competence? How is that actually proving that they've got a contingency plan? How is it that they can cope when things just don't go according to plan? So those are the, those are the real complex things that we're dealing with when we're talking about things like questions and answers, portfolios, all those types of things. I'm not saying don't use questions and answers, but give them context, give them, give them media, ask them to apply them to their own workplace or a simulated workplace or their work placement. So any anything that is is work focused as we possibly can and meets those abilities, um, you know, the dimensions of competence, that's what's really important. So I I don't know, I could go here all day, but I think one of, you know. We're so stuck on um, ASQR and compliance and a unit of competence. So, and so many times I see a, a teacher pull out a unit of competence and then they start working through it. And I was like, no, 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 just forget about that for the minute, put it aside. I know our compliance team kind of hold their breath when I ask for that. But what I ask for is what's the work function? What are, the, what are they doing in the workplace? And work backwards. So create a series of tasks that are, that are valid and authentic. Um, add a rubric to it, then turn around at, a, at an outcome. If there's 30 components to the unit um, of competence and the outcome is the, unit, is the unit and then your mastery is at 30. So every time they hit, you know, hit that outcome and every time they meet that criteria in that task, then all of a sudden it just automatically rolls up in the background. Canvas will look after it for you, but you've got to be able to set it up in a really valid and authentic way. And you've got to be able to hustle because if you can't do that, you, it's, you're, you're going to be eaten alive. Your, your industry in particular, I mean, you're in vocational education. Um, yeah. And uh, I, you know, I used to teach in vocational education. I remember going to a, uh, a conference one time and I went to a vendor booth and I had my, my badge on. I was working for Tate New South Wales at the time. And um, it, I remember this vividly. They said, uh, oh, so you're sending me those students uh, that don't really know what they're doing. <laughs> uh, nice. And uh, I'm just like, actually, not me personally, but I understand where you're coming from. <laughs> it's that ticking the box, right? And yeah. that's, that's not enough for assessing um, no. you know, whether they can actually do it. No, not at all. And like recognition, when we apply recognition to a student to recognise the skills and abilities they already have, we work backwards in that manner. So why is it any different when we're undertaking a learning and assessment pathway? I, I don't I don't understand. If we if we're ticking the box, we we we're doing them a disservice and we're doing industry a disservice. So their students are the ones, you know, ask for themselves, they turn around, they will tell you it's the application of knowledge. So you can't apply knowledge by answering a question. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> No, I mean, these skills that we, we teach students, it, it is the application. It's what do, you, what do you do with it when you're actually in the workplace? Um, yeah. you, know, you need that context. Um, Andy, for those who don't know, Andy's from Barker College, uh, which is a K-12 institution here in Sydney. And um, yeah, I, I suppose you're preparing those students for vocational and higher education. So what's, what's your take on yeah, absolutely. Uh, shortcomings? <laughs> yeah, I'll add my my quick uh, hello, Warami Mitgar from Darug Country uh, in Sydney as well. And um, yeah, look, like what Marita was saying, uh, it really does depend on, I suppose, what you mean by the traditional assessment. But suppose in the K to twelve, it's it is seen as the summative task. And uh, I think for us, it's it's really just about remembering the purpose uh, and and the strengths of some of those tasks. So maybe. Um, you know, a summative task isn't itself a, a bad thing, but um, remembering what its purpose is and uh, that it, it's really only showing you and maybe one part of a learner. So um, if you think of a summative task's purpose is to evaluate where a student is at in their, their skills, their knowledge, their understanding, uh, that's still an important part of assessment. But... Uh, well, we've lost your audio, Andy.
All right, we might give you give you a sec. Just oh, you there? Yep. Is that okay. better? Yep. I've just switched gotcha. to my, yeah, sorry. I switched to my other mic. Um, <laughs> yeah, so yeah, look, so the summative task is is to evaluate uh, those skills. The formative tasks for us would then be about monitoring progress. And 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 that's that's a really important piece in uh, not only just waiting for students to get to that end, that end result, but uh, looking at their journey along the way. Uh, and there's, there's probably still a role uh, to, that standardized tests play in this piece as well in, in being able to compare uh, students but by themselves all of those all of those pieces uh, you know aren't good enough as a standalone it's really how uh, how we can we can balance the data that we're getting from from a range of those tests and I suppose the other area um, particularly in k-12 that's that's emerging as as uh, a really important um, type of assessment is looking at personal attributes, and and those are the things that that we value in learners. So things like you know acting ethically, um, displaying uh, good citizenship, uh, displaying agency in their learning, those kinds of things. And um, and if if you're really just looking at you know traditional assessment um, as being you know a summative task you're really missing out on, on so many more pieces of what, you know, what a student um, should value, uh, what, it, what a, a student should um, try to, to work to improve. Yeah, and I guess, I mean, it's a little bit tricky as well. You know, in the, uh, the way that a lot of K-12 students get into university is through uh, those uh, you know, end of year exams uh, where they get their, you know, in Australia, the ATAR. Um, or equivalent score um, that is used as a judgment piece to for entry into university. Um, and uh, you yeah. know, those exams, you know, they do they reflect the actual skills of, of the student? Um, no, yeah. <laughs> well, you don't want, look, you don't want your whole K-12 experience to be leading up to just one uh, university entrance exam uh, because the flow on effect for that is that, um, you know, teachers and, you know, because they're sort of forced in that situation uh, are backwards designing, but uh, we're really just thinking of that as, as the end point when um, I think we're starting to, to really understand now that there's, there's so much more to what we should be uh, instilling in students uh, rather than just, you know, a, a, a ranking uh, number at the end, you know, at the end of their school existence. So, I mean, that's why you've probably seen lots of articles about, you know, uh, alternative to the ATAR or the the, the end to the ATAR, and um, and and I think that there's there's great appetite in uh, in schools, particularly in secondary schools, for um, that that conversation, that dialogue to continue. Sean, I was about to hand over to you, and you got your hand up, so that's perfect. Now, I was I was just going to just going to add from the from the point of view of people who are who are seeing students coming out of out of K twelve into into higher ed. Um, and as as Andrew has mentioned, you know, there's there's this kind of focus on on really high stakes assessment, so things like ATAR and so forth. Um, and we and we the kind of skills that we're developing in students, um, obviously, is the skill to be able to respond under under pressure, you know, in a in a very high stakes um, situation. Um, and I guess I guess we're training them for something that we don't really want to be doing at at the university level, you know, or the or the polytechnic level. We want people to be thinking about a portfolio, you know, about a about a lengthier engagement with a with the curriculum. Um, and I think we forget that you know, with with high stakes assessment, what we're actually teaching um, teaching students is a kind of a really narrow set of skills, which is you know responding under under pressure, mem uh, memorizing, regurgitating content, and so forth. Um, you know, thinking back about what Marita was saying, that's that's not a set of skills that you're typically asked to apply in the in the workplace, right? High stakes, individualized, um, re, um, recall, not not the kinds of collaborative, um, more sort of processed focused um, skills that people actually need to use in in the university and in employment. So that's so that's a real challenge for us, I think. I mean, most of our, um, you know, whenever you have um, situations where people are, are sort of thinking about assessment, they tend to default back um, back to those kinds of things because they're the things that they know, they're the, they're the things that maybe they did when you know they did when they were at school, um, and and they they consider them kind of valid, and if you like secure. Um, 
that's that that's a serious issue for us to confront you know how do we move away from that kind of high stakes one shot model um because we tend to seem to we tend to default back to it you know whenever, whenever anything goes bad like ai comes along default back to high stakes one shot assessment you know that's a that that's a serious issue i think yep 100 percent agreed uh annabelle do you have anything you want to add to that Yes, I think in the university context and in certain disciplines particularly, we're not actually training someone to do a job that we know what it's going to be like, but we're educating people to be ready for a future in a job that may not look anything like it does now. So when we're um, assessing, what employers are often asking for are things that aren't usually assessed in our most common forms of assessment, which are often um, exams and essays. But employers, I think the number one request is for communication skills. And there's more than one way to communicate. So we, we need to be preparing students and be assessing them on, on different modes of communication. So if everything goes into the exam or essay written work basket, we're not really giving that range. And if everything is an individual assessment as opposed to teamwork, we're not giving students what employers are looking for in now and we're not giving them something that's going to be useful for them as they need to adapt to whatever's coming up in the workplace in the future so I think um, recent developments are kind of you know a bit of a kick up the bum if you like to to move away from some of these assessment practices but they're um there are a lot of practices we can put into place um, to be meeting students' needs a lot better and preparing them better for, um, for the workforce as well. 100%. And that is actually a really beautiful segue to what I was going to talk about next. So what, what are some of those options? You know, how do you design assessment um, to make it more authentic, uh, more applicable to the workforce for what students are wanting to do? Um, why don't we, I'll go back to Andy. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll ask around. We'll st yeah, start at the beginning, I suppose, of the uh, of the, the learning journey. Um, I think some of the the, the strong appetite in K to twelves are really around two things. Uh, the first would be about continuous assessment, progressive reporting, those those types of models where um, we're we're essentially putting more stock into the the learning journey, into the progress uh, rather than the final product, um, and. Uh, the, uh, there's a lot of schools uh, using tools like Canvas to to be able to um, to, to unpack a large assessment, uh, place checkpoints or or these these uh, smaller progress uh, check-ins along the way, um, and really breaking down a task. You might have a first draft as a as, as a checkpoint, uh, but before that, you might even have uh, can you construct a, you know a topic sentence or, or something like that. So, so actually looking at the the skill of writing. Uh, as as something that that can be developed um, and and give, giving the students a, a pretty clear picture about uh, this is where you're at at this stage and uh, what do you need to move forward um, to improve to the next level uh, and that that's much more powerful than um, sort of waiting till the end and just having um, sort of almost a po post mortem on a task where you're looking back at you know what you should have done uh, if you ever had to do this this very specific test ever again uh, which which never happens so um, I guess, yeah, the focus on on ongoing uh, formative progressive reporting styles of activities uh, where we're trying to develop those skills uh, is, is one way that I think a lot of K-12s are, are, you know, heavily involved in at the moment. And I suppose the other way is uh, goes to that uh, that other form of assessment where we're looking at the values and, and attributes of a learner. I think there's there's uh, lots of movement at the moment to to look at a learning profile and to try to try to well figure out first uh, what are the the attributes that a school might value and looking at ways of of being able to to collect that data uh, to report on that data. And it's it's really more about um, trying to get the understanding of of how a student is good, uh, not so much just about um, you know test results or, or test scores and 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 things like that. There's there's sort of a bigger picture um, that 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 we need to play there, and and uh, like like Sean uh, mentioned, 
when they do get up to that point of, of looking at a university course, I mean, most university courses have a list of, you know, a, a student when, when they're applying for a course, um, the types of skills and attributes that would be good for a student to demonstrate uh, in that course. So being able to tell a student uh, as they're finishing year 12 that, you know, you, you, you show really high you know, communication skills or collaboration skills, uh, those kinds of things means that they can match their skills with um, a, a course that also values those skills. And I think if we can get to that point, then we've, we've got a much better system where um, we're valuing skills and not relying on a, a little bit of a, a sort of a separate ranking system. Yeah. Um, Sean, do you have any thoughts on what Andy was saying there as far as that matriculation into university and well, particularly once they're in university, then how, how do we design assessments that are more authentic so, for, so that they're ready for the, the job, uh, you know, the workforce once they leave university? Yeah, well, I think I think one of the, one of the challenges is, is the degree to which assessments can kind of be personalised. You know, so increasingly, I think I think at um, at university level, people are thinking about are there other ways in which students can be given some, I guess, agency. You know, like for example, do you give do you give students choices? So so for example, they can they can choose to, um, you know, focus on a, a skill that that they that they know well. Like, can we can they be assessed on on for example a presentation rather than a written essay? Right? Can they can they draw on their on on their own cultural backgrounds, for example, in the way that they're assessed? These things are quite important, and they and and they're actually, I guess, um, putting into practice the the uh, the idea of students as partners. You know, which is which is which has become a really kind of growing um, movement in higher education. You know, are there are there ways in which students can be given a degree of agency or choice in the way that they're assessed? Um, obviously, that that has that that can promote equitable outcomes. You have to be very careful in the way that you manage it, you know, so that so that students feel as though you know the same level of work is being done by each person and so forth. But I think there are ways of doing that. Ultimately, what we're trying to do at um, um, university level is to educate people to be able to assess themselves effectively. You know, they need to come out with the sort of evaluative skills that they can then practice in the in the workplace. Right. So giving them some agency and choice um, sort of starts that process of thinking about evaluating what they do best, you know, um, what they can, what they need to learn, and so on. So they so they can become much more self-directed learners. And I think and I think that can that can happen right across the range of courses. Um, 100%. Um, yeah. I'm just thinking as well, uh, Marita, um, in vocational education, uh, along those lines, uh, you know, some of that personalization, um, you know, that there's RPL, <laughs> recognition of prior learning, um, and you know, vocational education has done that for a very long time. Um, but you know, that's one way that you can personalize it for for students is to actually recognize that it's very prevalent in vocational ed. Um, you, know, you can get similar thing where you can get credit for similar subjects at university and things like that, but it's a lot more hands on, I think, in vocational education. Um, yeah, what what are your thoughts on how uh, assessment, you know, well, first of all, do you want to chat about RPL really briefly? Uh, and then second of all, um, yeah, how, how can assessment be designed better so that it's better assessing what students are actually doing? Look, to be honest, I think RPL is a great model for assessment, whether it's an RPL pathway or whether it's actually a genuine learning or assessment pathway. It's about collecting, you know, like we were talking before about, uh, Andrew was saying, you know, collecting that evidence along the way and not making it this one-stop shop where everybody stresses out about what's going to happen at the end of the week. Fortunately, we've moved away from that method a little bit, but we're still not totally there. And so, I mean, I think... The other thing is too, we've got so many pressures from our uh, regulation and ASCA and things like that, that there's there's a lot of uh, fear, I think. So a lot of the assessments are actually written for fear of uh, an audit or for fear of being called into question. Whereas if we turn around and look at things, you know, if you're benchmarking your sound, if you're benchmarking it or your model answers and everything is robust and it's valid, then the tool can actually be flexible. 
I'm not sure I'm saying how they apply that tool. Well, I'm in the workplace, so I'm, I'm going to provide these evidence. So same with RPL. I might not, I might not uh, do it that way, but I do do it this way. And this is the evidence that I've got to back that up. These are my workplace policies and procedures. If I'm not an apprentice and I'm not in the workplace or I'm not a trainee, then create a simulated environment for them. Create community events. Create all sorts of things um, where that they can actually apply those skills and knowledge. So it's actually picking what are the tasks that the workplace want, working backwards and making it meaningful because otherwise it just doesn't happen. It just it, it really doesn't mean a thing. So nobody in vocational education cares if you can write an essay. Yeah. They do care if you can write, complete an MSDS sheet and work safely and be able to turn around and lead others. So it's about using those workplace methods, not the other. Yeah, spot on. <laughs> I remember, you know, I, I did a business degree at university and um, I remember learning about uh, bonds at university and but it wasn't until I worked for a financial advisory firm and I was actually um you know applying that that I fully understood uh you know inverse relationship between price and yield and stuff like that it, it actually it didn't make sense so I was applying that um in what I was doing um and I'm, I'm wondering if that was a bit of a downfall of maybe the way it was taught maybe not or maybe it's just me maybe I'm not smart enough but um <laughs> But, you know, there's probably a lot of ways, uh, particularly in, in the, the tertiary level, where we could change how we assess um, students uh, along those lines. Annabelle, do you have anything you want to add on, uh, on that front? Yeah, I think um, all the panellists have actually said sort of the gold standard of what we want to work towards um, in tertiary assessment and assessment, whether it's formal or informal as well. But Andrew's, um, in fact, I'll start with Sean's talking about sort of personalising assessment. Um, a lot of schools, and Andrew, you'll know this, uh, have been working on inquiry-based assessment with their students. This is um, not a concept particularly well known in universities uh, amongst, you know, out, out in faculties, but you know, the whole lot of students are coming our way through the schools with a really good understanding of what that is and what the value of that is. And one of the values of it is that students can take something, as Sean's saying, that they want to know about, that they're passionate about, that means something for their own um, vocational um, goals, things like that. Also, the idea in a quarry-based process, you have some structure around that developmental assessment. So the sorts of things that Andy was talking about, come up with a plan, how are you going to evaluate this plan? peer review is it a good plan you know um then how are you going to implement things like that so that you can be working as marita says towards something that is meaningful for the student which is motivating apart from anything else and um you know good for for employment outcomes and good for moving into a workplace to be able to say i did um so a case-based learning on this particular data set in this particular workplace and i can tell you about that. So the application of, of knowledge in different ways is something that I think it's great to be moving towards. And those kids are coming from Andrew's schools and from all of your schools. So we've got to be ready for students who are motivated by that kind of learning. If, if I can add one, uh, one point on that, I, I absolutely agree. And I think that um, what Marita mentioned fear. There is there is a bit of a fear. Uh, I think uh, in primary schools, in junior schools, inquiry based learning is uh, is very much favoured. And then as the students sort of move up into into the high school setting, um, there is that fear that um, you know, well, is this really you know a valid and 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 worthwhile form of assessment? And and that's that's a that's a really interesting. Uh, tension that we're, that we're kind of dealing with, but if exactly if that if that sort of inquiry approach can can continue to flow on, I think it would have um, such a great impact as students finish their their secondary education. And I, and, I, and I think we forget I think we forget the concept. You know, we do as yeah. teachers we can we we can forget quite how much assessment drives learning. You know, <laughs> it's the concept of assessment and backwash. You know, how how we can, how can we use that productively? You know. So to use forms of assessment that really broaden out what students are being asked to do rather than narrowing it, you know? Yeah, so, assessment for learning. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. 
100%. Um, I, I noticed there that peer review was mentioned briefly in the chat. Um, yeah, that's a really handy tool. Uh, just as an FYI, um, a new, uh, new and pretty version of peer review is coming to new assignment enhancements, just oh, so awesome. everyone knows, which will be really cool. Um, but anyway, we're not here to necessarily spruik new features of Canvas. Um, just thought I'd pop that in there. But Sean, whilst, whilst we've got you there, you know, the million dollar question where the reason why we probably have 99% of people on the webinar today is because everyone's been talking about AI and chat GPT and tools, AI tools, um, and how that's disrupting uh, education. Um, um, particularly, there's been some, shall we say, some knee-jerk reactions uh, to tools such as ChatGPT being introduced. Um, but, you know, these tools can also be uh, positive for education. They can be learning tools. Uh, so how do you see these tools being used for learning? Yeah, well, I mean, I think, I think like any new technology that comes along, you know, for educational purposes, it really gets teachers thinking about our assumptions about what counts as good assessment, valid educative assessment, as well as our practices, you know, so, so that's a, that's a really positive thing. Um, I mean, I think, I think some of the, some of the reactions from people are, um, are like you say, might have ended up being a bit sort of knee jerk, you know, so people are coming back to, we have to have invigilated in person assessment so we can kind of, you know, uh, root out the cheating and, and so on. I'm, I'm not so much into that. I'm some, I'm, I'm sort of an, on, in the camp of you know this this technology is here let's see what we can do with it to enhance assessment you know rather than seeing it as something which is going to be necessarily negative um there's i guess there's three main ways that i th that i think it can be used really productively so i think it can supplement our design practices you know for uh, assessment so you know you can um you know it can enable us to assess some some new skills right because i mean ai is going to be a big thing for us in in the future so generating assessments that are actually going to enable us to, it's actually going to equip students to deal with that reality, you know? Um, so, and, and, and for us as, as people who are designing assessments, we can actually use it to, um, you know, generate questions, right? So we can use it to generate multi, a multi-choice or sh um, short answer questions. It can generate sample feedback or responses. Um, you know, that's really, really um, kind of a, uh, you know, time-saving um, opportunity for us as teachers, right? Using it to kind of predict what um, common responses might be to our questions and so forth. Um, I think it can supplement existing teaching practices as well. So not just the, the, the design of assessment, it can also supplement teaching practices like generate rubrics for us, um, help us to kind of um, generate discussion prompts, you know, things that, that are going to be useful for learning. Um, it can also give us give us a good opportunity to think about how we should interact with AI, right? And you know how do how do we deal with tech, with um, technological change in general, right? Because obviously, if we if we're um, you know if we're interacting with it as teachers, we can we we can model certain kinds of behaviour, you know, towards AI. How how can it be used ethically? You know, how can we kind of get around some of the biases that are that are that are built into it? You know. And I think finally, it can it can support students' learning, right? So so they can think about, um, you know, it can provide feedback on on work in progress, you know, which is a really good thing. So kind of like a like a peer, almost for us, you know. So um, it can it can be there almost like a, a discussant. You can put you can actually put stuff in. They can get feedback on it. They can um, they can respond to it. Um, and I think it, it's it's really good for, um, for example, students who have got English as an additional language, you know, or students with perhaps, um, you know, um, neurodiversity, um, for example, they might have issues with expression in, in academic English. Um, it can sort of get them some of the way, you know, with with those kinds of tasks. So I think there's, a, I think there's kind of three main ways it can really help us. It can supplement our assessment design, it can um, supplement our teaching practice, and it can also support students' learning, um, but but we have to see it not as a, not as an enemy. It has to um, sort of remain a kind of a tool that we can use to enhance what we're doing, rather than something as something we have to avoid or um, risk manage, you know, at all cost. So that'd be my kind of takeaway message. Um, I'm sure people have got other other thoughts to add to that. <laughs> yeah, Marita, why don't we circle back to you? Um, 
because it'd be, I suppose it would depend on what's being studied from a vocational uh, education perspective as to how you might use AI um, as a tool to help with learning. Absolutely. I mean, it, it, uh, you know, it, it really does just, it really does depend. I think the biggest thing, though, is that students cheat for years. Like, they student, and those students that do cheat, and I'm not saying AI is cheating, but what I am saying is that, you know, they've been getting their brother to write their assessment. They've been getting someone else to help them. This is not new. It's just social media. It's just that that's all it is. But it, we need to turn it around and make it something that we can enable. So, um, for instance, like our business students, like, it, you know, there are still a lot of things that you need to observe a business student doing. You can't use AI to do that. So at the end of the day, ask them to use AI. I, I did it the other day, just I wrote actual, well, I didn't write it, AI <laughs> helped me. Um, and I actually did a whole heap of questions for an interview. And I did my whole interview based on and my expected responses using ChatGPT, and it was great. I've written a few emails with it. It's really good. But then what we need to do is take it back, critically think about it. Is that, you know, does that relate to my industry? Vocational education is meant to relate to the industry that's in your area as well. So a lot of our areas, for instance, we will go and undertake industry consultation in lots of different vocations. And those sorts of things are what drive our uh, assessment practices. So, you know, chat GPT is not going to know that. So as long as you're applying, as long as your industry consultation is strong, um, ask the students to use it, compare it to their own workplace policies and procedures, analyse it, what's missing, what's not. Those are the skills to hustle. So, yeah, 100%. Um, interestingly, though, uh, you know, asking students to use it uh, can be a bit of a pickle for K-12. I'll, I'll go over to you, and Andy, on this, um, because uh, the terms and conditions say that you must be 18 plus. So that may, gives schools a bit of a quandary. Um, yeah, what are your thoughts on how you might then still use it as a tool um, in a K-12 context? But um, yeah, obviously, how do you deal with that with the students? If they've already accessed it, uh, yes, despite yeah. the terms and conditions? <laughs> Well, I can, I, I can tell you categorically that, um, you know, the majority of our students have uh, have, have accessed it, uh, despite that that age restriction. Um, from from what I'm, I'm hearing and reading, um, I, I do think um, with Microsoft's involvement um, as a large contributor to, to ChatGPT and OpenAI generally, um, I believe that they're they're working on a responsible AI framework. And when something like that um, has has put up some extra safeguards, I, I do think that that sort of eighteen over eighteen requirement will quickly go away, and it's just going to become a an embedded tool in things like well, it's already it's already trialing out in Bing in in Microsoft's uh, search engine, uh, but you can expect it in in Word or Excel or, or or other products as just an embedded tool. So I, I don't think that the um, that that sort of uh, over eighteen only is going to be around for very long, and nor do I think that that's that's uh, it's it's really going to to change uh, anything that it it does in K to twelve at the moment. Um, it has certainly yeah ruffled a few feathers and 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 uh, has created a little bit of uh, mild panic I think uh, amongst K to twelve um, teachers. But I think for us uh, as a school here in particular, it forced us to ask the question, well, why uh, why would students use this tool in the first place? And I think by looking at the reasons why they're using it, it gives us some some really good information about how we can how we can uh, adapt assessment to address those issues. So um, one might be that they're they're worried about uh, these high stakes assessments, and there's there's a bit of a fear. Uh, they might be a perfectionist. Uh, they might be worried that um, you've got you've got this one assessment that that's you know the majority of, of the percentage of of, of a whole uh, grade for the year. Um, and for that, the response would be, uh, as, as we've sort of spoken about earlier, is about uh, trying to devalue those that final assessment and place more emphasis in, in, in the progress along the way. Uh, and and that's, that's, that's one response. Another one might be, uh, and Sean mentioned uh, the idea of equity and, and equity in, in education is, is a huge problem. 
it's a huge problem. And uh, for those students that are using a tool like this because they need support, they need they need some scaffolding, they might read a question uh, for an essay and not know where to start or, or not even understand the question to begin with. Uh, and where they need that one-on-one, -on -one, that personalised support, uh, you know, our current model of education really struggles to provide that. So if you look at a student relying on this tool because they need that support, well, it's actually a wonderful use of the tool. Give me, give me some ideas, give me a structure, um, give, me some, give me a scaffold for how I might be able to answer that question. And if, if we can shift our thinking into just you know, trying to avoid using it and, and instead look at it as, um, you know, it could be a one-to-one -one, uh, coach for those students that, that, that need it. And I'd say what student doesn't need it, but uh, if, if, if we look at it that way, it sort of changes, um, you know, our, our focus. And I guess the, the, the last one uh, that uh, why a student might use this is because it's simply a, a boring task that they don't, they just feel like uh, it could be mindless busy work is, is a term I like to use, that uh, it's not really uh, anything that's that's exciting to the student. Um, and if if they feel no real connection to, to what they're being asked to do, well, yeah, they may as well just go in and get a computer to generate a response for them. And the, the way you tackle that is, um, is, is by looking at uh, tasks that are more authentic, uh, more engaging, and you can get that engagement by, by putting a bit of that personalization in there, uh, asking a student to, to uh, pick from you know, a range of topics that might interest them. Uh, there's lots of ways that they can demonstrate their understanding of, of, of key content and material, uh, but by still allowing them to, to um, choose a subsection of a topic uh, to focus on or to choose a, a form of uh, of a product so it might be a you know a, a visual display or, or a presentation or something like that uh, rather than than forcing everyone to do you know the, the same kind of written response so I think uh, yeah just by interrogating um, why we think students might be using these tools uh, does give us some good information about the ways that we can adapt assessments to 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 meet those problems. 100%. Annabelle? Yeah, I think one thing that's really also important to remember when thinking about knee-jerk reactions is that AI is something that has been promoting equity and accessibility for a long time in education and elsewhere. So the solutions that we might propose or the strategies we might propose, we want to make sure we're not actually uh, increasing the gap between um, between people, you know, people's abilities by by creating more hurdles. So that's something I think we need to do quite mindfully. But one of the things that I think we can do quite well with AI is to be talking about, not only talking about what AI can do, but what it can't do, and to use that as part of our uh, assessment literacy when we're talking with students. So for example, just as a really vague example, I asked um, ChatGPT to write a limerick about a dog called Maisie, which was the name of my dog. And it wrote a really, really bad limerick. But if I had a rubric about what was good and bad about a limerick, it got the meter wrong, it got the rhymes wrong, it had a very vague approximation to a rubric, but it just wasn't funny. And there were so many opportunities with a dog called Maisie for good rhymes, and it didn't use any of them. So, but what I could do with that kind of exercise or with something more sophisticated um, for students would be to say, this has been generated by AI, What's have a look at your rubric, what's missing? And I think to do that, you also need to have a look at your rubric yourself and you need to talk with your colleagues to make sure your rubric is assessing what you want it to be and is sort of connected to, to your um, intended learning outcomes, but also to your graduate outcomes as well. And just make sure that, that it is doing what you want. That also gives students, I think, particularly what we, one of the things we want to do when we're teaching is to develop students critical judgment and it is a good way to model that uh, and to sort of make it explicit rather than imp implicit because sometimes in teaching we tend to just make that implicit rather than calling it out um, so that's one way I think it can be used to quite good effect as well as having a discussion about what it can and can't do. Well you touched there really briefly on on limitations <laughs> of AI um, yeah, well, there are some um, 
some limitations. Uh, yeah, I'll throw it open to the panel. I'll start with you first, Annabelle. Um, yeah, what, what, are, what are some of the limitations you're aware of? Because I think it's really important to point that out um, because it can. those limitations can also be used as a, a learning tool. That's right. Well, writing a limerick <laughs> yeah. is one. Um, but also I've actually got the, the Australian Qualifications Framework next to me, as I always do. But one of the things that, like, at a university level you need to do is analyse, generate and transmit solutions to unpredictable and sometimes complex problems. <laughs> That's not something that AI can do. Um, but it might give a fairly good approximation of it. So working out sort of really in your rubrics what that does mean and how you're going to get students to show those things. What it can't do is reflect on what happened in class class today it can't um, read a diagram but then think about that for accessibility that's something you need to sort of measure in there too it can't um, take one side of a debate and then see the debate play out and then write a reflection on what both sides said um, so there's lots of learning activities um, that just won't be covered by it, but some of them are sort of deceptively close. So you've got to be you know, aware that, I mean, I've put in a question about um, what um, would a, what, what did I do in class today? And it's like, oh, I can't tell you. But then when you say, what would a first year student in a psychology say about this thing? It'll come up with something, you know, pretty vague and, and plausible. So we've got to be sort of assessment literate as well when we're, when we're looking at those things. But I did actually, one thing it can't do, and this is um, relates to what Andy was saying, it can't feel. So it can't feel intimidated and it can't feel threatened by assessment and it can't feel um, confused. And these are all things that we can address in our assessment design because if we don't want students to use aids like this or contract cheating particularly, what we can do is make sure that when we're designing activities that we're putting in um, opportunities for students to check that they know what they're doing, practice what they're doing, even with the technologies that they might be doing with it, to get some feedback, perhaps from peers or perhaps self-evaluate against a rubric before they sort of uh, have to kind of submit everything or else to have that kind of developmental assessment where you've got increments assessed over time, which means it breaks down that fear factor. Um, and so reducing the incentive for students to, to go outside those things as well. So I think that's, that's quite a, obviously AI isn't human and those human emotions are ones that we can really address and support students with, with good, not only assessment design, but good learning design. 100%. Um, and it doesn't always get the answer right. No, it doesn't. Uh, <laughs> I have wrong information. Uh, Sean, I, I think you want to comment on that. I know you've got some thoughts on that. Yeah, well, I mean, I think, you know, I think it's um it's very good at scraping, you know, this 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 huge database that it has, right? But that database contains both, you know, true and false information. Um, and I think, you know, it's 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 particularly bad at at kind of um, you know, referencing, for example. You know, which is which, which is one of the skills that we like to teach our you know our students at um, university level. So, for example, it it it'll just make up our references, right? So you can use it as a as a kind of a tool. So, for example, you could you could get students to generate something and then get them to figure out where it's got it's it's got it right and where it's got it wrong. Um, where it's kind of not, um, you know, it's not demonstrating academic in, 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 integrity, right? So 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 where there are issues with um, I'm referencing or wrong information. Um, so it can be a good teaching tool. So it can sort of provide you with exemplars if you like. Um, but yeah, it's it it isn't it isn't good at kind of um what's the word honoring its sources. <laughs> so yeah. it's also really, really bad at doing kind of you know those characteristically human things like being creative. I mean, I know it can mimic somebody, but essentially it's it's because it's an auto autocomplete tool, it's looking at stuff that's been done before. So it's not actually going to generate, you know, really new things. Um, and like Annabelle says, it's it, it's um it's not very good at emotion, which you would kind of expect, right? It can sort of mimic emotion like a like a you know a very clever robot, but it's not actually giving you the felt experience of people, you know. And that's I think that's increasingly important in 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 education is people actually thinking about their experience, 
you know, and and learning to talk about it in in various ways. So I so, so I think yeah, it, it's 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 interesting in that it kind of um, it suggests it, it's very very good at certain things and very very bad at others, right? So we need to 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 kind of test that um, and focus our uh, on our uh, focus our attention on the bits that it's not doing very well, like emotion, like referencing, like um, global thinking, like um, like creativity. Hundred um, percent. You know, we've got some a couple of interesting questions in the Q and A, um, and uh, just out of curiosity, uh, there was a, a question asked: you know, Any recommended reading for more specifics about how to design more authentic assessments? And mm -hmm. um, I popped that question into ChatGPT just now, and so I'm going to put the answer into the chat. <laughs> And we'll see what people think and whether it's a valid answer. Um, <clears throat> see if I can paste that in there. Oh, it's not letting me paste it. Is that a Zoom thing? Okay, that is not working. Uh, but it, it gave me a whole heap of references <laughs> of some books that you can read on, on ChatGPT. Well, um, I can. I can post one in. So there you go. There's a, there's a good one. <laughs> if, you just, if, you're, if you're designing at the university level, it's a really good um, uh, kind of a um, blueprint for thinking about authentic assessment and course design, which sort of um, involves assessment, obviously. So, yeah. So I was I was the chat, G, uh, you know, yeah, yeah, the chat on GPT kind of uh, live version, if you like. Yeah. <laughs> Even Sean, better. Just before you go any further, just to everyone who's on this call, Sean hasn't verified what's just been put in the chat. So please feel free to go down there at your own path. All right. Oh, exactly. We're just doing this <laughs> I just don't want someone going like, oh, yeah, we're on a Canvas chat. We spoke that. Yeah, we said we should use it. We, 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 don't, we don't want to hear any of that. Okay. That was just <laughs> really an example. <laughs> um, okay. So are there any other limitations? Um, uh, Marita or Andy, is there anything else that you uh, you're thinking along those lines as far as things to be aware of? Oh, uh, in relation to, yeah, I think I think we've probably covered most of it. But um, yeah, yeah. Else look, I think I think we did. Um, but I mean, I know it doesn't have uh, doesn't have those emotions. But if you had to say it's got one emotion, emotion, it might be that it's it's sometimes too confident. So when you read a uh -huh. response mm -hmm. and when it's when it's wrong, my favorite one, uh, and and uh, hopefully they no one's fixed this up yet. But I asked it the question: uh, Can humans run up a completely horizontal surface? And of course, a horizontal surface uh, isn't something that's a challenge to a human. We walk on horizontal surfaces all, all the time. But um, it's, its response was, no, humans cannot run up a completely horizontal surface. If you run or push against the ground with your feet, the force of your push propels you forward. And then I, I asked it, what about a vertical surface? And it, uh, it gave me the same response. So it, but yeah. when you read it through, um, it was, it's obviously this, I mean, there's loads of, of ways you can trip it up. Uh, but if you asked it a question, uh, it just gives you the response and it's very confident. There's no, um, there, there's sort of uh, no gray area with it. Um, so for a student that just takes something and doesn't evaluate it, doesn't have that base knowledge to, to kind of question uh, what might be put in front of them, there is, there's, an, there's a risk that uh, they're going to take that as, as sort of the, the you know, gospel information and um and it's unlikely but you know something like that it, it, it runs the risk of embedding those mistakes if if some fundamental uh knowledge is is sort of glossed over or, or incorrect I, th I think there's also big equity issues Paul because you know f um, it's not accessible to lots of people yeah. you know um and um they're also working on ways to uh, ways to monetize it so that the best version will only be available if you if you subscribe mm -hmm. to it. You know, obviously it'll be built into you know to different kind of commonly accessible software like Microsoft um, is developing its own version and and so forth. But um, people always always find a, um, always find a way of monetizing these things, which then kind of reduces access to certain people. You know, and I 
and I see that as a you know as an issue. And I think it's also trained on a on a um, a set of material that that has a whole lot of biases built into it. You know, so you've got to be careful that you know that yeah. it's not going to be spitting out stuff which is which is really inequitable. You know, um, they, these these models can be can be made to say some pretty disturbing things. You know, if if people aren't careful about the uh, about the way that they interact with them. You know, so I think it's going to, there are certain is issues we have to contemplate when it comes to the sort of equitable nature of it or otherwise. Yeah, I, I agree without without really putting some sort of ethical framework, even, you know, even if it's flawed, but without having that in place, um, yeah, the types of responses that it that it could uh, come up could be quite unethical. And um, it's, that's, that's a could be a very uh, risky area. Yeah, I believe there's already been some examples of that up on mm. Twitter. <laughs> mm. You don't One, have to look too far. Yeah, yeah. I won't give an example then, but you know, look, <laughs> or maybe maybe I will, um, because it 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 shows that it has uh, it, it's it's been tuned to kind of avoid this. But um, we did an example here with our staff about you know writing an email, like, you know, write me an email that I can send to my faculty to get them to to get off their devices during a meeting. And uh, it write a perfectly polite email. Uh, I asked it, can you write this uh, with a more stern voice? And it rewrote it and it was quite authoritative. Then at the end, I said, yeah, include a quote from a dictator and um, or like include include a quote from, uh, you know, from Stalin or something like that. And uh, at first it did that. And it just kind of shows that you know, it doesn't really, it doesn't understand that, uh, that that's, that would be an inappropriate, uh, you know, email to send. Um, I tried it again a second time, and it did come up with a response saying that, you know, Stalin was a dictator, and uh, this kind of email wouldn't be appropriate. But it just shows how flaky that that kind of uh, those ethical boundaries are. Uh, and, you uh, it's 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 just uh, open for for flaws and, and and for problems. And the other thing about it being trained on uh, a certain data set, including I think all of Wikipedia and um, Reddit as well, and is that it's um, at the moment um, ChatGPT specifically is sort of very much your your Western American kind of uh, spelling, but also approach. And I, one example that I heard recently was um, someone put in a question about um, Indigenous approaches to something or other, but it and it responded from an American Indigenous point of view. Um, so it wasn't contextual at all and didn't, you know, was drawing on information, um, you know, just on, on what's in there uh, now. These things are going to get better, of course, <laughs> and they are going to do accurate references. And you know, they are in my area of uh, Greek epic. It did manage to give me a quote down to two line numbers uh, of you know uh, from an ancient text. I mean, there's obviously a lot written about ancient text, but what it didn't do when I asked for a comparison, it did actually what a lot of first year students do, which is a description and an explanation. But I actually wanted a critical comparison, and it couldn't do that. Um, that's also the true for a number of students as well because we do get those very descriptive essays but that's something that we need to address in our teaching we don't want you to repeat the thing because I already know the myth and the kind of thing so it can be you know this is something that can really highlight that kind of assessment literacy and, and get us to be focusing on what are the things that we want students to demonstrate rather than letting through some of these kind of mediocre responses that these these kind of um uh, programs can do. Hundred percent. Well, thank you, everyone. I'm just mindful of the time. Um, this has gone really fast. Uh, I'm sure we could keep talking about this for hours because it's such a fascinating topic and um, very topical right now uh, in education. Um, it's definitely. Uh, I feel there was a comment. Uh, you know, Brett in the chat. So I'm glad we're speaking rationally about AI. There's been so much. Sky is falling talk uh, that people forget that these systems are decades old. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, as you said, Annabelle, it's just going to get better. And then how do we use these tools uh, to improve the way we, we do education? Uh, and I think that's been the point of today. And I appreciate everyone, uh, you know, coming on. Thanks, Andy, Annabelle, Sean, and Marita. 
Pleasure. Uh, really appreciate it. It's been a really great discussion. And I'll uh, hand over to Adam to kind of wrap things up. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. Thank you very much, everyone, for attending today. Um, for those of you who I want to share this particular presentation with other people, maybe to executive sponsors or teaching staff, or you want to use this as a baseline for something like that. A recording of this session will be made available by the Canvas community uh, that you can leverage off. Um, and also, like, as I mentioned before, it's, um, uh, yeah, will your limericks get better? Look, you're asking the wrong person. That's, um, that's a person preference and I choose not to get involved in that. So I'm gonna step that one to the left. <laughs> but once again, thank you so much everyone for your patience um, and being on the chat. I do apologize for that, that was my fault. Um, but hopefully we'll see you at our next webinar um, that we'll have later this year. And uh, should you have any questions uh, about how you look to do this in Canvas or have got questions about Canvas, uh, please feel free to reach out to your CSM or your customer success management team. Once again, thank you very much to our guests, Sean, Andrew, Marita, Annabelle. Uh, thank you very much for Rio and Candice, especially Candice for turning on the chat. Um, I was lost. And Paul for presenting today. So once again, thank you, everyone. Safe travels. Uh, enjoy. <laughs>